Now we have everything planned out and we'll get you a schedule so they get it typed up so that you know what we're doing um, this week and this month. But today, I'll be that way. <laughs> We are going to go over limits, continuity, and differentiability. Okay? That's what we're going to do today. We have all the topics split up, and we have study sessions planned for the last two weeks. Uh, right before the exam and the study sessions will go from 6 to 9. They should be in this room and in Mrs. Herzman's room and it'll be Monday through Thursday the last two weeks. Those are optional study sessions. You can come whenever you want. Mr. Dahman will be doing study sessions during zero hour. No, two weeks before the exam. So April 20-something. Oh, yeah, we only have four weeks. So, in a couple of weeks. What do we do after the exam response? Projects or something like that, yeah. Because we have to. Right here. I wish, but I can't do it. Okay, okay, guys. For study sessions, you can bring your dinner, uh, if you can bring friends. We have a lot of students that come for those. And as Mrs. Hersman says, we think it's the difference between getting a four or five on the exam. Students who come and do that do well. The other thing I'm going to say is you really need to be starting to study now. And some of you are going to say, well, it's a month away. We're going to give you a schedule of what you need to be studying. So this week you should be doing the 2008 multiple choice exam. Now, think about it. You get an hour and a half to do that. So if you did 15 minutes a day, how many days would that be? Six. So just do 15 minutes a day. You could, you could skip around and just do the limits and the continuity pieces. That's our, our thing. Or you can just work through it. Also, we're going to give you a big packet. This is for tomorrow. Do the limits continuity, and differentiability. Plus, I think it was a, I'm trying to think of what color it was. It's on my card, I think. You guys got a packet of materials. They were blue. It looks like this. Do the FRQs. on the same topics. So if you page through that, and the thing is, is you say, well, if FRQ is 15 minutes, well, it's only a little piece of the FRQ, probably. So the limit and continuity is on the very last page. And there aren't that many problems. We did not print out the Form Bs. Okay, you guys? We did not print out the Form Bs, uh, but they are online. So you can certainly do the Form Bs. The more you do, the more relaxed you'll be for that exam. Because you're going to say, oh, it's just like the tea and biscuits problem. Or it's just like whatever problem. That was uh, last year with tea and biscuits. And that's what we call them, too, when we are grading. So that's the plan. You know, if you could do 40 minutes a night now up to the exam, because there's no homework after the exam, you should be in great shape. If you put it off to even two weeks before the exam, you're going to realize you have too much that you have to review. Tomorrow, Tuesday, we'll go on with our topics in terms of reviewing, but we are going to have a little quiz. It's five questions, and it's from that yellow packet of those multiple choice. Remember when I gave you that yellow packet? You were supposed to go on Skyward. I'm not going to guarantee that the answers are correct on Skyward. I fixed them, but I'm not sure that it saved it. They should be correct. So if you haven't put your, res your uh, results of your yellow packet, out of hand, put that away, please, then you should um, 
You should go ahead and do it and put it on, and it will tell you if you're right or wrong. So you know. I don't have the solutions online. So we have a little quiz tomorrow. Is that part of like that huge handout that this is the 2003 exam. And it's multiple. Uh, it's multiple choices. Calculator, no calculator. And then you bring questions. Is this, is this what? <laughs> um, I don't know. But you need to do it because the 85 percent is May 9th. It's 100 percent May 9th. It's your AP exam. So if you can't do these, you're not. You're gonna have the same problem on that. So yeah, you need to be looking at doing those. And I picked problems that were really, really important, that I know are going to be consistent. Hey, Adam? Yep. Paul? So that's the plan for today. Next week, and we'll, we'll deal with it more next week, guys. Next week we have the MCAs. So juniors, you need to review, and I think we have a packet coming for you, or I'll put it up online. Probability and statistics is going to be your challenge. You will fail. Okay, you guys? I have, a, shh, right event. I have a practice one. I have online, but I don't think I have it in your folder, but I can put it Why there. Why would you need a practice MCA? Make sure you pass. I guarantee you every single person in this class passes with an iPad track. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, so next Tuesday, this is third hour, I'll see your, this class. The hours 1 through 3 next Tuesday and 4 through 6 on Wednesday. Juniors, you have MCAs both Tuesday and Wednesday. Friday, uh, seniors, seniors, you have senior retreat Tuesday and you get to sleep in on Wednesday. And there's no break other than that until Memorial Weekend. Excellent kind of less disruptive. <laughs> okay. Are you ready? We'll start with limits. Okay, I'm videoing this and I will also put up online my videos from previous study sessions and previous years. So if you get done with this and you want to work at it, that's fine. If you want to look at a video, it will be there. I will create a new file. Look. I will create a new file, and it'll be AP exam review. And it'll be under your, your AP stuff. So you can look under there. OK. What is a limit, Luke? It's a what? It's like the answer, but it's not the real answer. Oh, answer is too vague. What's it? By the way, do not use the word it on the exam. It's the value of the function. Because we don't know what it means. Even though we might even be able to assume from what you've written, we can't do that. We're not allowed. So you have to use the words. It's the value of the function as x gets near a certain value. Let's call that value c. It's the y value. And that's all it is. Do you guys need to move up front? OK. It's the y-coordinate. When you get close to a certain x-coordinate, what is the y getting close to? Don't make it complicated, because that's as hard as it is. OK, Ellie, you need to put your book away. We're taking notes on this. I do not have this up online. This is reviewing the entire year. OK? Do we care, Artivan, what happens at C? I care. You might care, but do we care? We do not care. What happens at x equals c? There could be a hole there. Alexis, I don't really care. I just want to know what my function is getting close to.
Okay, if you guys are going to have your conversations, I'm going to tell you that the door is there. We do not have time for this. Every single day is planned. We are solid for a month. Okay, so here's C. And if you're traveling down this road and you're getting closer to C on the X's from either direction, what's the Y getting close to? Well, we'll call that L. But, you know, even if C doesn't exist, F of C doesn't exist, we don't care. I do care when I'm talking about continuity, but just for a plain old limit, I don't care. How do you know if a limit exists? These are things you have to know. These are the highlights. For a limit to exist, what has to be true? All right, the limit from the left has to equal the limit from the right. If you're trying to meet your parents at the Mall of America, you better both be coming into the same location no matter what direction you come from, or you're not going to meet, right? Piecewise functions are always a problem. So they might ask you, and I did, do believe they did last year on the 2011 exam, they asked you if the limit existed on the FRQ. And you would come back and you'd say yes, because the limit from the left is a given value, and the limit from the right is given value, and you can say then they're the same. But you had to actually make the statement, the limit from the left equals the limit from the right. So you can't be short, you're doing shorthand on this. You have to be real clear about it. Okay, do you remember uh, what happens with limits? There are four things. When we find a limit, and I'm going to teach you something a little bit new. To find a limit, what can happen? The limit as x approaches c, uh, f of x, there's four things that could happen. You could get a number over a number. It's boring, right? Right, Adam? Because it's whatever it is. There's nothing to do with that. You could get 0 divided by a number. But what is 0 divided by any number? 0. Okay, so those are just numbers. It's just L, whatever it is. Okay? You could get a number divided by 0. And what would we say there? Undefined or does not exist. We will deal with that in a second. It's okay. If the limit is infinity or negative infinity, it's okay to say the limit does not exist or undefined. You will get the points. If the answer is the limit is negative infinity and you say the answer is positive infinity, you will not get the point. You're better off to say it does not exist. So you've got to be particular about that. And the last one, which is 0 over 0, that's right. Don't stop believing. Don't stop. Do you remember what that's called, 0 divided by 0? Indeterminate. And we have to do some algebra. Or I will teach you right now a little uh, calculus, I don't believe I could call it a trick, but a theorem that will help you when you get 0 over 0. But it only applies when you get 0 over 0. There are other situations, but you will not run into them. The problem is, the reason why we don't teach this to you when we're doing limits is because you'll apply it all the time, even when it doesn't apply. And it's called L'Hopital's Rule. It's a French guy. And if, qualifier, the limit as x approaches c of f of x is 0 over 0, and you need to write that down. We looked for that when we were grading the exam. It's a BC topic. If the students didn't write 0 over 0, they did not get the point. They had to write 0 over 0. They didn't have to write L'Hopital, but they had to write 0 over 0. So be safe. Write that out. If that's the case, and this has to be a fraction, so let's make it f of x over g of x. So we must have a fraction of 0 over 0. Then the limit as x approaches c of f of x over g of x happens to be the limit of the ratio of the derivatives. It's not the quotient rule.
So you could do algebra or you could use L'Hopital. But the problem is, don't use L'Hopital when you can't. There's a reason why we don't teach it to you when we do limits, because limits is overwhelming enough. Now you're more familiar with limits and hitting back on it, so it should be okay. So what if I did the limit as x approaches 2 of x minus 2 over x squared minus 4? So if I substitute 2 in, what am I going to get? 0 over 0. Notice this has to be a rational function, which means fraction. So if you don't have a fraction, you may not use L'Hopital. You see the word ratio in there? Rational, ratios, fractions. Fraction, I see the word ratio and fraction as well. They're all the same. I just have to ignore the C. Okay, let's do this the old way. What did we do a long time ago? We factored it, right? And you can still factor it. There's nothing wrong with that. This is pretty easy. But this will save you a little bit of work on the exam if something's difficult to factor. This is x minus 2, x plus 2. And because we don't care what happens at 2, I can go ahead and divide numerator and denominator by x minus 2. Because those are the same numbers and they would reduce. Don't forget to put the 1's in here. So this ends up being what? 1 over what? 2 in? Good. But that's not that hard. But I can do L'Hopital's rule if I want. Because I got 0 over 0. And you just put a little L with a circle around it. And now we take the derivative of each of those functions. So the derivative of x minus 2 is what? 1. And the derivative of x squared minus 4 is 2x. And if you substitute in x equal 2, you get what? 1 fourth. So when you run into these on the multiple choice, it'll most likely be multiple choice, you can use L'Hopital's rule because they don't check how you did it. It's just not there. That's so you should be writing this down. Okay? Let's look at some ones that we need to know. Do you remember this one? The limit as x approaches 0 of the sine of x over x. Remember that limit, Adam? It's 1. If I substitute in 0, I get what? 0 over 0. And we, tr we did graphically, remember? And doing it, proving it's kind of tough. But use, let's use L'Hopital's and make sure we get 1. Okay, what's the derivative of the sine function? Cosine. And the derivative of x is 1. What's the cosine of 0? Sure enough, that worked. Worked really nicely. What's the limit? Now be careful. As x goes to infinity of the sine of x over x. Now here's where you have to think a little bit, Carolyn. The sine of x is doing this, right? It's trapped between 1 and negative 1. So the most this could be is 1. And this is going to get infinitely large. What do you think that limit is? That's zero. Okay. So Vitalis rule does not apply. Cole, you should be writing this down. Because when you write it down, you'll remember. Plus, you are creating notes for you to look at the weekend before the exam. So, oh yeah, I remember that. You're just going to flip right through it and you say, I know this. If you wait till the week before the exam, you're waiting way too long. Okay. You see why L'Hopital's rule does not apply? Zach? Why does L'Hopital's rule not apply? I get the sine of infinity over infinity, and that's not 0 over 0. If it were infinity over infinity, it'd be different. But I don't even have that. There's another one you have to know. So make sure you read what x is approaching. Okay, what happens if I substitute in there? I'm still on the front page. <laughs> That's 0 over 0, right? Do you agree? Okay. 
Do you, does anybody remember what that one is? What the value is? And if you don't remember, you can use L'Hopital. Does anybody remember? Carolyn, you remember? So let's use L'Hopital's. What's the derivative of the cosine? Negative sine of x. It won't matter because of the answer we're going to get here. But it is negative sine of x over what? 1, which is 0. Now for the real challenge, and you need to memorize this one. The limit as x goes to 0 of 1 plus x to the 1 over x. Another form of it is this. It's the limit as h goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over h to the h. Girls, we don't have time for that. Alexis, do you know what that is? Does anybody remember that one? No? Well, here's the deal. What's it doing? What's my board doing? Let's look at the first one. They are the same, actually. But x is getting smaller. Okay, Adam? But your x is not zero. Remember, we don't care what happens at zero. Okay, Sarah? This is one plus a little bit. Have you ever taken a number bigger than one and iterate, which means, like, if you took two and you square it, you get four, and then you take four and you square it, you get 16. You take your output and you square it. Does anybody know 16 squared besides me? <laughs> 256, right? It's going off to it. If I keep taking these outputs, it's going off to infinity. What if you take one and you square it? One. But see, this isn't one. This is a little bit bigger than one. Yeah, I would think that, except that, and this is going off to what? I have it right, right. That's getting, no, one divided by zero is getting bigger and bigger. So you think it maybe it goes to infinity, but it doesn't. There's a limiting value. We did this graphically. What will be a, a possible answer since there is a limiting value here? It's E. Well, you didn't say it. Because if it were 1 to the infinity, that would be 1. But this is a little bit bigger than 1. That's getting big. What's happening is, is this is going towards 1. This is going towards infinity. And they're tugging at each other. And E wins. <laughs> now you need to know that one. You need to recognize it when it's on the exam. So it's E. So I would probably put a big star by this one and say, I, I need to review that the night before the exam. Just remember that I recognize that limit. We did it graphically. So are we okay with limits? They're both equal to E. Because if H goes to infinity, what's 1 over H going towards? Zero. And if H goes to infinity, it's going to infinity. So this is a form of 0 to the infinity, which is indeterminate as well. Next year in BC Calc, we do more of that. Not, not a lot, but we talk about all the forms. And then we learn how to use L'Hopital's rule to do that. You don't want to see that on this. You can actually prove it that way. There's other ways to do it. Any problems with limits? Remember, a limit is nothing more than the y coordinate. What is the output getting close to when the input gets close to a certain value? And it's just close to. I'll meet you near Macy's. Maybe not at Macy's, but near Macy's. It's the same type of thing. Okay? Remember to find a limit. Remember the limit from the left has to equal the limit to the right. And then there's also these main limit laws. I almost forgot those. Um, I don't remember what page it is in your book, but do you remember that if I take the limit of a sum, that I can distribute that? Lexus, do you remember that? It's the limit of f plus or minus the limit of g. 
We'll just do some of the basic ones. Distributive property does not hold for every single operation you know of. Exponents, it does not work. Okay, what about the limit of f times g? You can find the limit of each one separately and multiply them. Can you do that with integrals? No. I wish. Now, there's a condition, provided that each individual limit exists. We don't have to worry about it this year. Next year, we'll worry more about that. Um, anyway, what's, oh, how about the limit of a constant <laughs> times a function? Remember, we can pull that constant out. Sometimes that's handy. And then there's the composite limit theorem. And what that says, and I'll give you an example, is if I take the limit of f of g of x, and I'll be particular as x approaches c, that's equal to the limit, oh, sorry, it's equal to f of the limit of g of x as x approaches c. You use it all the time. Because we rarely deal with functions that are not composite. So if I had the limit as x approaches 1 of the sine of x squared plus 1, you don't have any problems with that. You just go ahead and substitute in 1, but that's a composite function. So it really, if I wanted to show the work, but they won't ask you this, but it's the sine of the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared plus 1. So it's allowing me to put the 1 into the inside function. So I get the sine of what? 2. And you're saying, well, that's pretty obvious. What's the big deal? Because what if I have this? The limit as x goes to 0 of e to the sine of x over x. So that's e to the what? If I put in 0, I get 0 over zero, right? If you just do straight substitution, and you may not realize it's the same as this. It's e to the limit of the sine of x over x. I can pull that limit inside that function, and now we know what that is. What is this limit? That's one. So when they're written differently than just a s simple trig and polynomial, you know, that's the problem. Then you have to recognize the composite limit there. Okay? Are we okay with limits? You're feeling comfortable with them? You should be able to calculate them? Limits are nice when you have trig functions, polynomial functions. It's only when you get division by zeros when you have some issues. Oh, we have another thing about limits that I almost forgot about. What about the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x? These are horizontal asymptotes. And then we also have vertical asymptotes. And that's the limit as x approaches some c value of f of x. So this would be something like this. The limit as x approaches 2 of 1 over x minus 2. Those to me are domain problems. When you have a vertical asymptote, you are going to have division by 0. I mean, I can't think of any of anything else. I'm going to get division by zero, so vertical asymptote. Okay, so when you do this, you have to look at the limit from both sides of two. Do you remember that? If I'm coming in from the right, it's either going to be positive infinity or negative infinity. So if I take something a little bit bigger, like 2.1, is that positive or negative? positive infinity. What if I come in from the left? And we should know what this looks like, by the way. Sorry. Because that's the same as 1 over x, just shifted 2 units which way? 
to the right. I know I always get that mixed up. So what if I come in from the left? 1 over x minus 2. So I would be looking at 1.9. So that's going to give me what? Negative infinity. What could you put on your exam? You could write does not exist if it's free response. Otherwise, if, you, if, it, if we're looking at this one as negative infinity and you write positive infinity, I don't believe you're going to get the point. The better off writing does not exist. But they might say we want to graph it, so you might have to look at it and see which way it's going. Whoops. Try that again. Okay, horizontal ones, and you guys have some words for this, but I don't like that. I just actually just do the problem and think about it. This is the limit as x gets really big. And so let's do 2x over 3x squared plus 4. And I just look at the problems. What's that getting close to? Now just think about it. As x gets really big, this really looks like 2x over 3x squared. Now you guys learned some things about Bob and whatever, I don't know. Because that's memorizing, and I can't remember that. It's easier just to look at that. It looks like this. So, Adam, what does that look like if I reduce that? Why? Because it looks like 2 over 3x, doesn't it? So this denominator is getting big. I just look at them. Limit as x goes to infinity of how about 2x squared over 3x squared plus 4. What about that one? Hey guys, shh. This looks like, all we look at is the leading term. You're going to have to find the highest exponent. That's just two thirds. Well, I don't have to memorize anything. And by the way, so this is going to go to zero. This is two thirds. If they ask for the equation of the horizontal asymptote, then this would be y equal to zero. This would be y equal to two thirds. What if I had the limit as x goes to infinity? By the way, if they're asking for horizontal asymptotes, you do need to look at from both directions. So let's, let's do negative infinity of this one before I get to the last uh, examples. What's that going to be? If x goes to negative infinity. It's still going to be what? No, it's still going to look like what? 2x squared over 3x squared. What happens if you square those negative numbers? The positive. So that's gone, and what's the answer? Still 2 thirds. So in 2008, in particular, focus on number 19. They threw that problem out. We've done that problem in this class. Let's go back and look at it again. It's a horizontal asymptote. Also, be careful when it's multiple choice. When you see the right answer as the first choice, read through the other ones anyway. Because that's what happened with this one. Only part of the right answer was the first choice. And so people saw the right, that answer, and they just skipped the rest of the choices. Read through them all. Because there may be another answer there. Pop. Yes. I want to do the limit now as x approaches infinity of 2x squared over 3x plus 4. Alexis, what does that look like? Forget the 4, it doesn't matter. It looks like 2x squared over 3x. So it's 2x over 3. So it does not exist, or you can say it's positive infinity. If we go to negative infinity, it's going to be negative infinity. They're not always nice little polynomials. What about this? x squared over e to the x. And you just have to think. Take a number. I take 10. 10 squared is 100. And e to the 10th, is that bigger than 100 or smaller? It's bigger. 
So what's happening? This is getting big, but this is getting bigger faster. So this is going to what value? Zero. So sometimes we're comparing polynomials with exponentials or trig functions, and then you just have to think a little bit. So those little tricks you learned last year don't help you, unfortunately. OK, that's all the limit stuff that I can think of. Now, let's do continuity. I'm going to add a page. And do you remember what continuity is? Now, keep in mind, if I have a continuous function, what does that mean? Call? Natalie, what does that mean? Put your phones away. You don't want to see phones out. No jumps, no breaks. No jumps, no breaks, no holes. Can you have sharp corners? Yeah. Yeah, that's differentiability. Sharp corners are OK. For it to be continuous. Do you remember the three pieces you have to look for, Carolyn, to get a continuous function? Remember, we had you memorize this. 75% of you got it right when it should have been 100. The first thing is, what did you say, Cole? F of C must exist. That's a domain question. If you want to see if a function's continuous, you can't just have a nice little break in the graph at some C value. F of C has to exist. So that's domain. Is your function defined for the domain? Hopefully, yes. OK, what's the next one? Close, but look at that's the third one. The limit as x approaches c of f of x must exist. So the limit has to exist. Let me draw one where the limit does not exist. What about this guy? f of c exists. But does the limit exist at c? Because the limit from the left and the limit from the right are not equal. OK? There's a break in the graph. What kind of functions look like that? Adam? That's right. <laughs> Step functions, in particular. Now, step functions are continuous except where the break is. So this part of the step function is just fine. OK? Now, if I go back to my first picture, does the limit exist? Does this limit exist? Yeah, because we don't care what happens at C. But what if I did this? What if f of C is this value? Does f of c exist? Yes. Does the limit exist? Yes. Is the function continuous? What do, we ha what do I have to do to fix the problem? That point has to be right. It has to fill that hole. f of c has to equal that limit. And on the exam, if it's a free response question, you would have to say the limit as x approaches c of f of x, which is what, what Alexis was talking about, is equal to f of c. All well, that statement tells you, it tells you everything. It tells you there's no breaks in the graph. The limit exists, the function exists there, and they're the same. They have, they have to be the same. So if they asked you if something was continuous or not, you would have to invoke that statement. You would have to use it. You can't say it. You'd have to find the limit, you'd have to find f of c, and you'd have to say they're the same. And I've seen it on the exam. So I know it's, it can happen. If you look through that little grid, you'll, you'll find other things. The other thing about continuity that's nice, well, you might not think it's nice, is they can tell you you have a continuous function, and you can generate some equations. This is an equation. And if I know one piece of it, and I need to solve it, I can solve that equation for the piece I'm missing. So you'll see some problems like that. 
but they usually are coupled with differentiability. Okay, are we okay with continuity? Oh, what functions are continuous? Let's make a little list. Oh, I like that one. You can have a limit exist, but the function need not be continuous. If you have a continuous function, then the limit must exist. And I don't like that one. I can't reverse an if-then statement, but that's the way it is. Somebody said absolute value functions are continuous. Yes, they are. Polynomials. Excellent. Exponential. Square roots on their domain. There's always that qualifier there. What other kind of functions are there? We got polynomials. That's a polynomial. That's a polynomial, too. My favorite functions of all is actually T. <laughs> trig. You hate trig functions. They're continuous on their domains. The other word that you may not think of is rational. And by the way, this is a theorem. So if you were on the exam and they asked you if the function was continuous and it was an absolute value, you can just say absolute value functions are continuous. We all have agreed that they are continuous. You don't have to prove it. So you could use any one of these. Okay. Last but not least, let's talk about derivatives. Now, do you remember where derivatives came from? No. Let's take a curve here. And we'll take a particular value, call it C. And we'll go over a little distance here, call it H. Okay, you guys, we got to remember this. I'm going to watch my time. What is this value here? C plus H. So this ordered pair is C comma, this is F of X. This is F of C. What's this one? C plus H. F of C plus H. Remember what we did? We drew this secant line. Coming back. Now, what's the slope of the sec? This one makes sense to me. What's the slope of the secant? Is equal to f of c plus h. Do not find slope. Minus f of c all over c plus h minus c. And this has a special name. This is a rate of change, but what kind of rate of change? Average. I my car was in the shop this week, and I had I got a loaner car, so it was a brand new uh, Infiniti G25 that I was driving. But what was different on that car than I have on my car is there's a gauge here, but I thought it was really cool, and it was your miles per gallon. And so if I'm accelerating. There is my miles per gallon. That's zero, and it went up to 60. If I was coasting down a hill, all of this would be shaded. Is that the average, or is that the instantaneous? Yeah. It was very obvious to see how it was changing. But when I go in and fill up my car, because I always like to check my mileage, I'm always calculating my average rate of change on my mileage. So I take the total number of miles divided by the total number of gallons, and I get my miles per gallon. Huh? <laughs> well, when you are counting pennies and gas prices as four or five dollars a gallon, you start doing it. And you say, do I really need to make this trip today? Or can I combine it with other trips? Love them. Anybody. You guys? Guys. I thought that was pretty cool. So, what's the difference between this and instantaneous? What do we want H to do? Go to zero. Now, on the exam, okay, you guys, 
I want, I'd like to get this all done today. On the exam, thank you, girls. <laughs> um, you are not most likely. I have not seen the definition of a derivative on the exam where they say use the definition of a derivative. Not in many, many years. However, you'll see multiple choice questions that look like this. They're going to say, oh, that's just the derivative of whatever. So I could have the limit as h goes to 0 of the sine of pi plus h minus the sine of pi over h. Hey, guys, it's not time to go yet. What is that? That's the derivative of what? You guys, do you know how to expand that? I don't know. This is the derivative of what function? It's the sine of x. All right, x equals what? Zero. No? Okay, come on, have a seat, please. We don't leave until I dismiss it. Okay, this is the sine function evaluated where? At pi. So you're going to look at this and say, oh, what's the answer to the derivative of the sine? Cosine of pi, you guys remember what the cosine of pi is? Negative 1. Do you want to really expand all that out and do the algebra? Not me. I don't think it's time yet. And then I will finish up with differentiability and then we'll continue to average value if we're out of time.